Hey guys, here for a quick reaction video of Demium 25's Christmas special with Yanis Varoufakis and Noam Chomsky. It was a really interesting video on the state of the world and reflections for the end of 2021. But I wanted to home in on a very specific part that talks about what it means to have basic morality. I'll also cover the issue of Noam and Yanis, two brilliant minds, accepting the Uyghur genocide narrative and discuss what I think is going on behind the scenes there. I have quite a few followers that don't really like Noam Chomsky, surprisingly, and would rather point people towards Michael Parenti in a heartbeat, and I totally understand that. Michael seems to have learned from past propaganda and has an ability to see through it and use history to actually learn from it and apply real lessons from it. Whereas Noam is oftentimes ready to lead people into the same mistakes. You know, some people go as far as calling him controlled opposition. I'm not sure if I necessarily agree with that, but granted, I haven't explored that idea enough. Personally, I think regardless, I appreciate a lot of Noam's work. He has incredibly valuable insights, and there's still a lot of value you can get from him. But when it comes to narratives against China, I really do get the impression that he really and truly ignorantly believes them. With Yanis, however, I think that even though he seems to believe it on the surface... I don't think he actually really does. I think he can see through it, but he's willing to play along to make a more important point, a point that Noam actually helps him make, even from the perspective of somebody who really believes the China narratives. Um, and this more important point that this pair is making is about what it means to have basic responsibility and morality. If Yanis had come out and said he didn't believe the Uyghur genocide narrative, he'd immediately turn audiences off from a more important point that he'd like to make, one that audiences need to hear the most, even more so than what is or isn't happening in China. By pretending to, or what I believe he's doing at least, believe in the anti-China propaganda, he's able to say that even if you take these claims of oppression in Xinjiang at face value, the actions of the West and its so-called human rights activists is nonsensical, illogical, and lacks any self-awareness. Now, I'll play that clip for you at the end, but for those of you who don't remember, I've continually tried to make a similar point, but I don't reach as many people on the opposite side because I'm not willing to play along with the phony propaganda against China. I know people who are personally affected by that propaganda. I know that sanctions are designed to take opportunities away from people who I know in Xinjiang and do what sanctions have always hoped to accomplish, create unrest and destabilize a rival country. It has nothing to do with helping the actual people on the ground. The entire world has famously voted against brutal American sanctions in other contexts year after year, but the U.S. refuses to let up. Now, information on a lot of the shocking things that the West does is available and can be found, even if they're not really widely known. What you do with that freedom is even more important than having the freedom to begin with if it only ends up breeding complacency. Pointing out to someone lecturing me about the lack of press in, uh, free press in China that they've never once said a single word of support for Julian Assange should be enough to provide and provoke self-reflection, no matter what they think about the rest of my views. But it doesn't do anything. This is why, in some cases, there is a benefit to playing along with and entertaining the most ridiculous propaganda to make a more broad and, like I said before, important point. I've also said that even if a fraction of the millions of dollars in funding in, that anti-China reports get was put towards reports trying to build narratives against the West, it'd be incredibly easy to come up with something even more damning. You could choose anything. You could say that America's committing an ongoing genocide against ethnic minorities in the U.S., then begin mining for data to support that claim, using all the same tactics and tricks that Western scholars use against China, and you'd actually end up with something even more compelling, especially if you focused on forced labor and looked at the labor programs at America's prisons, or the people who were human trafficked into Georgia's workforce and were threatened, beaten, killed, and raped, as we discovered last month. Or if you try to speak to the people who have been talking about their own experiences with prison labor. But even I often forget that you don't even need to do this. You don't need to work with theories. And you won't end up with just inconclusive evidence that says there's a reason for concern, like we see with many of the commission reports on China. 
There's literally a trail of blood, death, and destruction everywhere the U.S. goes. There's real, actual hard evidence. You don't need to do an investigation. But if you try doing one like the ICC did, you'll be sanctioned and attacked. If you're a journalist like Australian journalist Julian Assange, you'll be slowly killed in a maximum security prison as the U.S. considers ways to assassinate you as you face extradition to the world's current global superpower, which has no jurisdiction over you to begin with, all while people ironically are distracted and complain about a proposed extradition bill between China and its own territory of Hong Kong. Fearing that it would be abused, the media has you more concerned about an extradition story that has nothing to do with you and ignoring the one that has direct implications for you and the societies that you live in. It's absolutely absurd. We've got a superpower that commits the atrocities that they want you to believe China is also committing domestically, but instead carrying them out globally across our entire planet. What kind of cognitive dissonance needs to be involved in order to stand for this current global world order, a current global world order like this, and panic when the first sign of a new power comes along that doesn't murder their way across the planet, who isn't interested in taking over when you really look at the facts, but who could at least finally introduce true multilateralism and accountability, and who can't be bullied into complying with the brutality of America and its global hegemony. In the Yanis and Noam chat, they spoke a bit about what former Australian Prime Minister Paul Keating had been saying. Paul had said, China does not represent a contiguous threat to Australia. China is not about turning over the existing world order. It only wants to reform it, and wants to reform it only because of its scale. Paul also said that the threat that China poses to the United States is its mere existence, as it can't be intimidated the way Europe can be. Now, I'm getting a bit far away from the main topic I'd like to discuss here, but I recognize if I throw things out there like China isn't a threat to the world without addressing it even a little, I will lose people who have been so conditioned and indoctrinated to believe that China is indeed a threat. At the same time, I can't keep going down the many rabbit holes to f are required to fix every misconception about China. So it's, it's, it's a difficult balance to strike, and I'll have to get back onto the main point for now. While you hopefully recognize that China not being a threat to the world using existing evidence is a whole topic of its own. There's something more important to say here about basic morality and ties into a point that I've made many times. If you're pretending to care about domestic human rights abuses in China, you're pretending to care about the humans of this earth, you're pretending to care about right versus wrong, but you have little else to say than just... That's what about is, and when someone points out that the things you think China may or may not be doing domestically, the West does on a global scale, well, then you don't really care about these things. I, I don't know why I don't know why that is. You know, maybe you just don't really care about anyone, but you've been conditioned and convinced that you should care about potentially oppressed people in China. And that makes you feel good about yourself, doing the socially responsible and trendy thing. Or maybe you can see through the hypocrisy and you just don't care. Maybe you're looking for a target so that you can feel better about yourself and overlook the atrocities that your preferred governments commit. Maybe you're a racist and the idea of seeing China and its people on equal footing on the global stage is offensive to you. And you wouldn't have cared as much about human rights issues in China had they just remained an impoverished country that made your small consumer goods. I don't know, but if you don't first use your power in your supposedly superior political system, which can supposedly be held accountable by its people, to stop committing human rights abuses, and you instead want to focus on changing what you consider to be an inflexible dictatorship overseas, then you don't really truly care about human rights. On the contrary, you're a cheerleader for a global world order which enables greater human rights abuses and exploitation on a, on a global scale. Even if you don't think you are first required to lecture others from a moral high ground rather than a low ground, fine. If you don't think you look silly and embarrassing from your glass house, whatever, okay. But what makes things more absurd is when you expect China to abandon its meritocracy-based system and adopt a Western liberal popularity contest-style democracy in order to improve itself, without ever needing to first demonstrate that Western liberal democracies have that capability to begin with, by getting your governments to stop committing brutal global crimes or pandering to the U.S.'s influence. Now, let me be clear about something here. This isn't only about the U.S. They are the worst culprits in many ways. 
but they're not alone. I think about, for example, my own country of Canada and its politicians virtue signaling China's treatment of minorities as they're still digging up unmarked graves of native children whose natives today are living on reserves with contaminated water just around the corner from the nation's capital. And when Canadian police show up and find tanks of actual clean water like they did at Coyote Camp, they happily dump them out on the ground. Turn that off, please. It's not your property. When you touch it, you'll be arrested for mischief. That's not your property. That's I can happening. turn that off. Isn't it happening? No, that's our property. Is it? Yeah. How did you get here? Uh, I want you to take a, look, a quick look at this next video also for a moment. And I want you to think about something. Imagine, as you're watching this video for a moment, that this was happening in Xinjiang instead of Canada. Imagine that the women in this video were Uyghurs instead of native people of Canada. And imagine that instead of Canadian police officers, it was Chinese police officers showing up with chainsaws in their hands. We're surrounded by tactical officers with guns. They cut off the internet. No. Oh, they're outside the window. You are trespassing against Order Wet'suwet'en law. Come out peacefully. Do you have a search warrant or an arrest warrant? We'll be seeking those if you're not going to cooperate. Well, you better have one. I know you asked for a warrant to enter. Our authority to enter will come under that injunction. They're walking to the door. They're breaking it down. Show me, Get that fucking gun off me! Get your fucking gun off me! Lower your gun! Get your fucking gun off me! This is sovereign like two at a time! Get your gun off me! CMP have breached the door. They are acting under the authority the, of the, the injunction. The attack dogs are there. There are attack dogs here. Standing there, right beside the door. Police. They used axes found in camp to break down the door. And a chainsaw. And a chainsaw that they found in camp. Can we roll you under arrest? Don't touch me. Don't, Don't touch her. Touch me. Let, get your head off of her. Get your head off of her. This You're is under under arrest. with so it's in territory. Can I get someone to grab her? Stand up for me. You're under arrest. I'm guessing that most of you haven't seen that video. But if this was in Xinjiang, you would have already seen this by now, multiple times. It'd be played on repeat, and you'd be constantly reminded about it. You wouldn't need millions of dollars in NED or US government funding to write thousands of pages of reports looking for human rights abuses in Xinjiang. You'd just be able to use raw content like this. If the geopolitical target was Canada, you'd also know that the RCMP had approved lethal force against Indigenous protesters. This story would have been burned and reinforced in your mind, helped along by U.S. government-funded marketing campaigns. Now, some of you may say, well, that's the beauty of the West. You have free press, and this information is at least out there. Great. Well, what are you going to do about it? Do you have the freedom to bitch and complain about this, but not to actually do anything about it? 
Is this really the kind of win that you want to brag about? What are you doing for the kids in Vietnam or Fallujah who are still being born with birth defects from your chemical weapon attacks? What are you doing for Daniel Hale, who's in, for, who's in prison for telling you that America's drone strike programs was killing civilians nine out of ten times? Nothing? Not even after Biden was bragging about this very over-the-horizon drone program that he said America will continue using in a press conference when he was celebrating a recent drone strike that killed 10 out of 10 civilians, including children who were running home to greet their father returning with fresh water. You know, you've been afraid that innocent people were scooped up into re-education programs in China. And all while you're not doing anything to stop the drone and airstrikes that continually outright kill countless innocent people. What's really going on here, guys? I mean, obviously I'm speaking to a very specific group of people when I say this. Many of my you know, followers already know that, that something is really wrong here. But for those of you who I am speaking to, who I am addressing this to, do you really care about human rights? Are you not aware about the brutality of your governments? Is your attention and effort so easily redirected and exploited like this? Do you perhaps know about these things but think you can't make a difference? And if that's the case, why would you even begin suggesting China adopt your broken political systems? And what about when you start considering how many times you got humanitarian interventions wrong or how many times you've been led into conflict based on false pretenses and outright lies? This adds an even more complex but important set of considerations. I mean, there are many more questions you should be asking yourself as you try to figure out whether you're really the good guys or not, whether you really should be proud of your behavior or not, and whether you really are morally superior than the people you virtue signal. But this video would go on for too long if I explored this further. So from here, I will leave you with that clip from Yanis and Noam talking about the principles of basic morality, even from the perspective of taking anti-China propaganda at face value. See you next time, guys. Peace. This balance seems increasingly difficult to maintain. Uh, I find it personally very uh, trying that um, I have simultaneously to suffer the slings and arrows of those who accuse me of being a, an agent of the Chinese Communist Party. And, you know, some people who are supporting the Chinese Communist Party who are uh, portraying, me as a, portraying me as a stooge of Western imperialism. Yeah, how are you handling this? Do you have any hints? Our priority always, any moral human being, your priority is one should be what you can hope to change and influence. Uh, I can't change the crimes of Genghis Khan. I can protest them, but I can't change them. The I can protest and do protest the brutal authoritarianism and cruelty of the Chinese government, but I can't do much about it. So the uh, persecution of the Uyghurs in concentration camps, I can certainly condemn uh, by uh, provocative acts against China. We only increase the, 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 the repression, but we can certainly protest it. We can cooperate with elements within China, which do exist, that are seeking amelioration and reform to the extent we can. So we can do everything we, we can that is within our reach. There are other things we can do within our reach that we're not doing. So what's happening in Western China is bad enough. How about what's happening in Gaza? In China, a million people, Uyghurs, were sent to concentration camps, detention camps, treated very badly. In Gaza, a million children are living in situ virtually unsurvivable situations. Mm -hmm. uh, water's poisoned, uh, constant attacks, uh, sewage systems destroyed, uh, water uh, power systems devastated. Uh, uh, military attacks anytime Israel wants to do it with U.S. weapons. Well, we can do something about that. A lot. We can end it. Okay. So that should be our priority. 
Incidentally, we all understand this very well with regard to enemies. So take, say, Ai Weiwei. Uh, I don't care, you don't care whether he criticizes US policies. If he wants to, okay. If he doesn't want to, it doesn't matter. Uh, his role is to be concerned with what he can influence to a limited extent. China's policies. Same with East European dissidents under the Soviet Union. We didn't care what they said about Western crimes. We didn't even care when they supported Western crimes, as they often did, sometimes in very ugly ways, but didn't bother us and shouldn't have bothered us. Their job is to uh, deal with the crimes of their own society, things they can do something about. When we can do something to help others under distress and oppression, should certainly do it. But the main priority is, the main decision of any moral person is, what can I influence? That's what I should, should be my priority. That's just elementary morality. I mean, if a mm -hmm. crime, say, suppose I read about a, a crime in, uh, you know, Siberia. I can't do anything about it. Suppose I read about criminal acts in the town where I live. Well, I can do something about it. <laughs> Even if the crime in Siberia is worse, the moral position is the one you can affect somehow. That's elementary morality. <laughs>